childbirth. Exciting and wonderful, yes, but just as terrifying. Whether you believe in creation or evolution, we can all agree that the act of giving birth seems almost cruelly dangerous. In 2017, the World Health Organization released some truly chilling statistics. Around the world, more than 800 women die from delivery complications every day. But it wasn't always this bad. No, in fact, it was a lot worse. As recently as before the turn of the new millennium, maternal death rates were almost double that of present times. It's sad and ironic, isn't it, that so many have lost their lives in the very act of giving it. Human beings are by nature storytellers. It is one of our most valuable traits, in my opinion, and our love for tall tales makes the world around us so much more interesting. Not surprisingly, a phenomenon so closely associated with pain, life, and death will be universally filled with myth and superstition. Around the world, folklore surrounding pregnancy and birth exists that span centuries old, perhaps even older, and still endure today. The Irish tell of changelings, malevolent creatures who spirit both mother and child away to a fairy world, replacing them with malicious impostors. The Abume of Japanese folklore is a spirit of a woman who died while giving birth, and can be seen on dark, rainy nights, crying for someone to look after her baby. But neither of these creatures are as terrifying or as bloodthirsty as arguably the most popular ghost in Southeast Asian legend, the Pontianak. My name is Joshua Tan. Welcome to Hantu. Legends of the Pontianak date back as far as the late 1700s. While details are scarce, the first recorded tale speaks of a man named Sharif Abdurrahman al Qadri, a ship captain who stumbled upon a stretch of unsettled land, untouched by locals for fear of evil spirits. Pontianak, they called them. Now, while Sharif Abdurrahman was a seafaring man, free land was an opportunity too good to pass up. He just needed to get rid of the pests first. He reasoned that whatever is scary enough to frighten the living would be good enough to frighten the dead. So he did what any respectable sea captain would do. He fired his cannons again and again until he was satisfied that whatever lurked in the undergrove would have fled in terror. Either from the cannonballs or the sound, he really didn't care which. And so, with the land seemingly purged of evil, he claimed it to build his sultanate. Today, it is a modern, multicultural city that still celebrates its roots, firing cannons during major holidays to honor the victory of the very first sultan. The name of the town? Pontianak, in West Kalimantan, Indonesia. Over the years, the origin story of the Pontianak has evolved. Folklore does have a way of changing with each retelling, after all. Today, the modern and most widely accepted version of the Pontianak is a vengeful spirit of a woman who died while pregnant, or while delivering a child. Driven by hatred and anguish, she takes out her anger on those unfortunate enough to cross her path. She is often described as pale, with long black hair and a white flowing dress, stalking lonely roadsides or abandoned buildings. Her face is said to be beautiful, her demeanor charming, even flirtatious. A facade used to better seduce men with, they say, lulling them into a false sense of security, only revealing her true demonic nature when it's too late. What lurks behind her glamour is much less pleasant. Red eyes on a rotten face, with sharp teeth and long claws. As is common to most spirits of Asian lore, the Pontianak is a violent, bloodthirsty creature. Her scythe-like nails are used to rip it to her victims before eating their organs and drinking their blood. So, if you ever find yourself walking outdoors alone at night, 
pay attention to these subtle signs. Legends say they might just save your life. Listen out for the howling of dogs that turn to whimpering. The sweet smell of frangipani in the air. A baby's cry that starts out loud and slowly fades away. And perhaps the least welcome of all, a shrieking, hair-raising laugh. All these might just mean there's a Pontianak nearby, and she could be getting closer. Lisa was uncomfortable. Adam, her husband, had assured her that he was fine, that he was perfectly okay with the long drive home. But it was getting late and very dark, and the highway was a treacherous road to navigate, even in broad daylight. She turned to glance at him in the driver's seat. Adam caught her gaze and smiled at her. It would be fine, he said once again. He wasn't sleepy. He was alert and more than capable of getting them all back home safely. She smiled back, but deep down, his reassurance did little to calm her down. The only real consolation was that their baby in the backseat was fast asleep. A screaming, crying infant was not a distraction they really needed right now. The darkness surrounding them seemed blacker than a usual night, pressing down on them, engulfing their car like an unseen monster. With their headlights barely showing anything more than a few feet ahead, in Lisa's mind, every turn in the road felt like a dangerous ambush. Taking deep, steady breaths, she willed herself to relax. Staring out the window, she allowed more pleasant thoughts to chase away her worries. She thought of family and friends, of Adam and their beautiful child. And finally, it worked. Her anxiety crept away into the unknown parts of her mind. She closed her eyes and allowed herself to sleep. She wasn't sure what woke her up first. Perhaps it was a strange silence, or the feeling of the car slowing down. She looked outside. They weren't anywhere close to home, but Adam was guiding their car to a stop. A breakdown, he would guess, but it was a strange one. No warning lights, no noises, no smoke from the engine. The car was driving perfectly one moment and completely dead the next. As the car stopped, Adam opened his door. He was just going to check on the engine, he said. But all the anxiety Lisa had been holding back crashed into her like a violent wave. She wanted to scream at him to stay, to wait for, well, anyone to help. As Adam climbed out of the car, he gave her one final instruction. Lock the doors. She watched as he walked to the front of the car, lifting the bonnet and disappearing behind its metal veil. She looked back to check on her baby, who to her surprise, had awoken without a sound. His bright, curious eyes were wide open, staring back at his mother. She climbed into the back seat, picked him up, and cradled him in her arms. It was unusual for him to be this quiet, but she wasn't complaining. In some strange way, she felt like he was comforting her a lot more than the other way around. Seconds crept to minutes, and Adam still had not returned. She was sure he was still there. She could hear movement from the front of the car. Perhaps he had found the problem and was looking for a way to fix it. After what felt like an eternity, Lisa saw something that filled her with relief. The flashing lights of a patrol car coming up the highway. Perhaps they could reach home before sunrise, after all. The policeman, however, drove right past them, before screeching to a halt a distance ahead. They got out, but instead of approaching her, stayed put, shielded behind their doors. They shouted at her to come to them instead. Quickly, quietly. She flung the door open, her baby cradled in her arms, and she ran as fast as she could. All the while, the policeman screaming at her not to look back. As she reached the safety of the patrol car, she turned around for the very first time. What she saw would haunt her for the rest of her life. On the roof of her car, 
what looked like a woman in a white dress, drenched in blood, feasting on an animal carcass. Only Lisa soon realized it wasn't an animal. Her last sight before passing out was the creature's lifted hand gripping the severed head of her husband Adam. The story doesn't explain why the lady and her baby were left physically unharmed that night. Perhaps the Pontianak saw her as a kindred spirit, a woman she admired and even envied, the mother she could never be. Or perhaps she was full from her feast and couldn't be bothered to waste more energy getting to them. Either way, they survived the night with only memories to haunt them for the rest of their lives. As with any power, even those beyond our understanding, there are those who seek to control it. It is human nature to exploit for selfish gain, and it's not surprising that Pontianak's fierce reputation has made her a morbid prize by those daring or foolish enough to try. One of the most popular myths about controlling Pontianak involves plunging a nail into the back of her neck. Doing so is said to change her ghastly appearance back to her human, much more attractive form. She becomes meek and submissive to the whims of the one who subdued her. Indeed, village men have been known to stay outdoors late into the night, hunting for the next wife, literally. Now, I can say I condone this sort of behavior, but if you're so inclined to try, I beg you, before you go driving nails into any necks, you should probably check first if they have a pulse. Feared, reviled, but also admired. In today's more liberal age, the Pontianak's otherworldly, destructive will has made her an icon of feminism in popular culture. She is symbolic of the rage and unfulfilled desires of repressed women in a society where patriarchy is the established way of life. Unbound by the constraints of societal norm, wild and free of judgment, a man-eater both figuratively and literally the world may be dominated by men, but in the shadows, the Pontianak reigns supreme. There is much to fear about her, but a lot to sympathize with as well. The path of motherhood is filled with as much risk as there is reward, and really, when you strip it all down, her story is simply one of unresolved grief and loss. Someone who sacrificed everything for the promise of family and ultimately lost it all. Her tale is a reminder to better appreciate the women in our lives, because in one way or another, their voices hold immense power, and to ignore, or worse, restrain them, might just lead down a path of darkness and terror. This episode was written and researched by me, Joshua Tan, and features music by Mew. If you've made it this far, thank you. I hope you enjoyed your time listening, and if you did, Please share it with someone you think might like it too. Till next time, stay safe and stay curious.